Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Thursday, February 13th Parks and Recreation Board meeting. I'd like to call up Kylie Martin to lead us in the flag salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Kylie. Could we have the roll call, please? Ms. Bergdorf? Present. Mr. Gussow? Here. Mr. DePaulo? Here. Ms. Gamino? Here. Ms. Flowers? Here. Thank you. And now I'd like to do some rec recognize the Parks and Rec Volleyball Team Southern California Municipal Athletic Federation Finals. <clears throat> After finishing in second place in the 2019 Parks and Recreation Volleyball season, the Spikers, a team of nine youth volleyball players, moved on to represent the city of Burbank at the Southern California Municipal Athletic Federation Finals, otherwise known as SMAF. On November 16th, the Spikers represented the city of Burbank as they attended the regional SMAF volleyball tournament in West Covina. After a series of great games played during a full day tournament, this team came home with first place. All players received a medal and the team was presented with a first place trophy. By winning this trophy, they were invited to attend the SMAF Volleyball Finals in December. On December 7th, the Spikers played their hearts out in a single elimination tournament located in Downey. Their bracket included another Burbank team, along with teams representing Downey, Lomita, and Pasadena. Although the competition was tough, the Spikers played aggressively and finished the tournament second place behind Downey. The girls have a passion for the sport of volleyball and by playing in the city of Burbank, they had a multitude of opportunities to present their town, not to mention the memories they will cherish for future years to come. Way to go, Spikers. <laughs> now I'm going to come down to the podium, and I'd like to bring up head coach Don Jensen and assistant coach Charles Bradley. Congratulations. I know that was a, it's a great win. We're very proud of the both of you for leading these wonderful young ladies. Congratulations, lady. That is really something. I'm very proud of you. And gentlemen, yeah. thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. Fantastic. All right. So right now, we would like to call you up one by one, and we're going to present you a certificate from the Parks and Recreation Board. The first one is Angelina Dulutri. We're going to shake hands. How's that? Congratulations. Great job. Next, we have Ava Tomlinson. You're welcome. Congratulations. Emerson Jensen. Congratulations. Henry Virtue. Come on up here, Henry. Way to go. Thank you so much. Congratulations. Keegan Hutzbeth. Oh, not here? All right. Oh, Kylie Martin. There you go. Congratulations. Thank you. Mia Learned. Congratulations. Natalie Buffalino. Oh, she's not here either. Okay. 
It's all right. We'll call, we have to call out her name, and maybe she's watching at home. Uh, Natalie Dadio. There you go. Congratulations. We have two more. Coach Don Jensen. Congratulations. You shake your hand, too. And Charles Bradley. Thank you, Charles, so much. Thank you. What an honor. This is great. and Rec Recreation Department. We accept these. This, these are beautiful. Are you sure you want to part with them? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, Wonderful. I will give them to our staff and they will proudly display them. Absolutely. Oh, thank you. Microphone. This is amazing. Thank you so much. I will give these to the staff and they will proudly display these um, in an area where our community can see it. So thank you so much. This is wonderful. Thank you. This is beautiful. Can everybody see this? This is really nice. Congratulations. Now you guys are going to win again next year, right? Come back? All right. All right. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Okay. Next, we, I'd like to bring up Kim Freed. We have announcements to make. Good evening, Chair Bergdorf and members of the board. My name is Kim Freed, and I am the Recreation Supervisor at the Jocelyn Adult Center, overseeing recreational programming at that facility and the Burbank Volunteer Program. RISE, our announcements tonight are, RISE invites community members of all ages to George Isaiah Park on Saturday, February 22nd from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. to play games, share ideas, and what they would like to see in future Burbank parks and open spaces. These will be, these there will be activities, food, and prizes. The Betsy Lukey Creative Arts Center is pleased to host the Fine Arts Federation membership exhibit. The juried mixed media exhibit represents more than 60 artists and will include painting, sculpture, pottery, collage, and photography. Opening reception and presentation of awards is on Friday, March 6th from 7 to 9 p.m. The show runs through March 21st. Play and recreate more this spring. We offer recreation classes for all ages and finding something for everyone. Spring class registration for Burbank residents begins on Tuesday, March 3rd at 9 a.m. Open registration begins Tuesday, March 10th at 9 a.m. To view the recreation guide and to register online, please visit BurbankParks.com. Do you dig Burbank? Volunteers with the Dig Burbank Group and work to, sorry, volunteer with the Dig Burbank Group and work together to keep our parks beautiful and clean. Volunteers help pick up litter and pull weeds. Dig days rotate around the city parks monthly on Saturday mornings from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. The next event is Saturday, March 7th at Ralph Foy Park. There's no sign up required, just bring your gloves and a digging tool. This, to see the schedule and for more information, visit burbankca.gov forward slash digburbank. 
Spring break is coming up. Spring days camp are full day camps where kids in grades kindergarten through fifth with arts and crafts, sports, games, science, music, drama, and more. Camp is $35 a day. The Nature Center is also offering a half-day camp option for $65. Campers will participate in hikes, nature crafts, and science projects. Registration begins on February 18th at 9 a.m. at burbankpark.com or in person at McCambridge Park for Springs Days Camp or the Nature Center for the Nature Camp. It's that time of year again for summer camp registration. Burbank residents interested in signing up for summer days camps can pre-register on from March 2nd to March 20th. Just simply submit your registration packet and you will be assigned a lottery number for registration on April 4th. Parks and Recreation offers a full day and half day camps, summer camps from May 26th through August 14th at multiple locations that provide safe and welcoming environments along with nonstop fun and unforgettable experiences. Camp hours are from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. with extended care offered from 7.30 a.m. to 6 p.m. For more information about summer days camps and registration, please call 818-238-5435. Or visit BurbankCA.gov forward slash camps. Specialty camps and summer sports camps registration begins April 28th. The City of Burbank is excited to announce that we've partnered with the U.S. Census Bureau to support 2020 Census on April 1st. The Census counts all people who reside in the United States, regardless of age or citizenship. Responses will determine how much federal money Burbank will receive for education, housing, health care, and more. An invitation to complete the census questionnaire should arrive by mail to all Burbank residents in March. Residents will be counted by submitting your response online, by phone, or mail. For more information, please visit 2020census.gov. For full details regarding our upcoming events, including registration information, please visit burbankca.gov forward slash parks and rec events. Thank you. And these, this concludes my announcements for this evening. Thank you, Ms. Freed. Next, we have uh, oral communications. Do we have any oral communications? I don't have any cards. No. Response to oral, none, obviously. <laughs> Written communications. None received. <laughs> none received. All right. No. <laughs> All right. How about how about park board comments? We'll start with uh, board member DePaulo. Um, I just want to once again uh, congratulate our great volleyball players and uh, coach um, coaches Bradley and uh, Don Jensen, who has been coaching since the early '80s. He's a 40 years he's been coaching. He's a member of the Burbank Walk of Fame. And I uh, want to once again congratulate them and thank the parents for all their support. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Chair Borgdorf. So <clears throat> I'd like to share something with my colleagues on this board uh, uh, some of you will remember a couple of years ago, we planted a tree um, in memory of Shane Prophet up at the Nature Center. And I got a text message this week from his parents. Um, the winds that we had last week wreaked havoc up there in the, at the Nature Center and unfortunately snapped that tree in half. So I've had conversation uh, with Miss Garcia and conversation with the um, Prophet family, and we're going to reinstall that tree with a small ceremony sometime between now and what well, we'd like to do it before Earth Day, which is April 22nd. And I just wanted everybody to know about that. Any other comments? We'll move on to new business. Uh, Gwen Indersall, Mel, excuse me. Please come up and we'll present the Burbank Roller Hockey Annual Report. Thank you.
Thank you, Chair Bergdorf and members of the board. Gwen Endermill, uh, Recreation Services Supervisor. Happy Valentine's Day, one day early. Um, I wanted to introduce, um, who will be coming up to speak later, is Scott Floman, who's in the audience, president of PIM, Inc., who uh, manages and operates our roller hockey rink. And the general manager is Dave Sirianni, and he will also be available to answer questions if you should have any tonight. I get the easy part about talking about contract compliance and working with PIM. Uh, they are the operator that manages our hockey rink down at Ralph Foy Park. And this is the second year of the agreement. So I know we have a new board member, so I'll, I'll kind of give you a brief overview of how we got to where we are, just to refresh your memory, because sometimes I think I'm, I'm a little forgetful as well. So um, PIM signed the agreement to run the ho hockey center uh, down at, at Ralph Foy Park in 2000, the end of 2015. They officially took residents in February of 2018. So they're completing their second year of operating down at the rink. So um, they re um, marketed the facility as LA Kings Burbank Sports Center. And you'll, you'll see the acronym in the report, but it was also known as in the past, the hockey facility at Foy Park. So um, I'll be speaking to a, both names tonight. So they're in their second year and it's been an incredible journey. This is the second of five years because the first two years they invested their own money and if you are familiar with the, the rink, we've replaced the board several times and it was kind of falling apart. It had been there for quite a while with the previous owner. So in their first year and part of the second year, they installed new rink boards, constructed a fully enclosed chain link fence, added the LA Kings logo to center court on the rink. They installed a, a, a locked storage shed for their rental equipment. They created a pro shop, which is the office that's there. There's two adjoining offices, one where you check in and the other is the pro shop. And they also sell snacks. Um, they installed a new electronic scoreboard, speaker, and console system, uh, new hockey goals and nets. And then the most recent improvement was uh, renovating the player bench areas in the dugouts. So all of that, we have basically a brand new facility. You wouldn't recognize it if had you'd seen it before, I know. Uh, Mr. Gus has been there before, so he's very familiar with the facility. In terms of the agreement, um, PIM pays fourteen thousand oh oh four for the whole year, and it, it's my pleasure to tell you that they always pay early, so it's kind of nice I don't have to chase them down. So I've appreciated working with them. Now, beginning this year, twenty twenty, they'll be paying a little more in rent, five thousand two fifty plus three percent of their gross profit. So our our commission will will kick in as of the first quarter, end of the first quarter this year. So if you um, look in your presentation on uh, your staff report on page two, you'll see some um, attendance numbers, registration numbers for adult and youth hockey. So the first year they started, the youth program was last year. Um, they came in in February two years ago. They, they focused on getting the program up and running, some startup costs. They had to get some equipment. So youth hockey started in 2019. They have 28 teams already in their inaugural first year. So that was very fortunate because, um, if, as you also have read in your staff report, a number of the people that were participating in the past had paid deposits for the subsequent season under the previous operator. So they were already committed to play, and then he moved over to North Hollywood and so they were kind of committed already to there. So we were starting a brand new program with brand new faces. And then in 2018 and 19, the numbers have remained consistent for the adult program. So we have 104 for last year and 107 for the previous year. And um, specific questions about the league and the rules, attendance, those kinds of things, Scott will, is going to address a little later on in his section of the presentation. And then if you also look on um, page 3, so we also started a ball hockey, which has been a tremendous, um, had, has had a tremendous impact on the rink. Because one of the greatest things about that program is you don't have to buy the expensive blades and all that equipment. So it's, an, it's a nice, less expensive alternative for adults and youth to participate in it. Because you just have tennis shoes, you run around, and instead of a puck, you're using like a rubber ball, kind of like a tennis ball looking thing. So that program kicked off, and you can see by that report, um, youth was, was 28 teams, and then the, the adults went from 13 to 16. So the programs are on the rise. Um, 
despite some of the setbacks that we had with um, some of the damage to the rink that we had to repair, um, but we're, we're well on our way and we're very pleased with the operation thus far. We also, uh, in 2019, PIM launched some other programs. We had some hockey clinics, lac uh, lacrosse clinics. It, uh, they call it futsal, which is kind of an indoor soccer um, with some abbreviated rules so you can hit the ball off of the walls and in that nice little area. So you can see the attendance there has pretty much doubled from last year in the youth program. And um, so this year we're looking forward to expanding that uh, youth uh, ball hockey as well as some of the other programs that they have uh, coming up this, this spring. The adults also have some expanded programming. They've got open time, open like open gym. They have open skate time in the rink. They have stick time. Uh, you, you can also go in and rent hockey equipment. And then we also have family skate night to, to attract whole families. They play music and it's kind of fun. They do that a little when it's a little warmer in the summer. So before I turn it over to Scott, I also want to um, make sure that you're aware that um, PIM has put in a request to staff after we've been meeting with them last year to defer some of the capital improvements. Although they, they went and spent their own money to make those uh, improvements in the first year and a half, we, and we do have a brand new facility. There's some other expenses that they're not necessarily in a financial position to make right just right now. So the first one is the shade canopy that would go over the, the main portion of the rink so that we can have a summer youth program. Right now we don't really offer it because it's so, so hot in the summer, but the adults will play no matter what they play at night. The kids will play on the weekend and it's a little hotter. So one of the things they wanted to install was the shade structure. And because the, the registrations hasn't necessarily grown as fast as they would have liked, because now we have a competing resource in North Hollywood, they're asking to defer that for another two years. And, and staff, we've met with them, and we've, we've looked at options, as well as um, we talked about the sport court option. Sport court, if you're familiar with it, is a, um, it's kind of like synthetic tiles that they put in a gym, and it's kind of a plastic material, and they had proposed to install that at the rink for hockey, but now they've expanded their programming for multiple sports, so lacrosse and soccer aren't necessarily a, a good playing surface for sport courts, so they're asking to, rather than install the sport court, is to resurface the court, much like we had it before with the painted, remember the blue court, that they would do that also, also instead of the sport court, and they're, they're asking to defer both of those for two years. They would do it before the second year, so it would be fiscal 22-23. And staff supports that. Um, we would like to present that to city council uh, to amend their agreement. And based on their performance for the first two years, we've been very impressed with them, and, it, and we think that really makes a lot more sense to do it in, in that way, uh, is to defer it for a couple years and let them develop their clientele, and then they'll be in a better financial position to do that. So... Um, that concludes my report. I think we'll, maybe we can in address questions after Scott comes up to discuss uh, some of the programming aspects there and kind of share some little surprises with you on, on how well they're doing. So, Scott? What? Uh, I'll go tell him. Okay. Hello, everyone. How we doing? Hello, hello. Yeah, this is Dave. Hi, how you doing? And I'm Scott. Uh, for those I mean, I know a lot of the faces, so good to see you all again. Um, so we're back. Um, you know, things have been progressing really nicely, especially with our uh, kids program, because uh, it was quite a challenge when we started. Uh, and going to touch a little bit on ball hockey. And one of the things that's so great about it, and if you're, if you're um, from if you originated from you know up north back east in the summertime it was a big sport you know because everybody melted their ice rinks and so people went and played ball hockey that was that was the thing to do so there's a lot of kids that don't know how to skate um don't have the gear that we're talking about and so literally you need tennis shoes we have all the sticks we give out helmets um we actually even the la kings donated a bunch of stuff to us as well so it's been a really, really great program. Um, and Dave's actually been working really, really hard with, uh, you know, the community. And the nice thing is we're getting a lot of local 
kids that are coming because that's really the big thing that we're going after roller hockey uh people chase and we even have adults from ball hockey that are coming all the way from how far away quite a, quite a ways to yeah. actually play garden grove area yeah so you know our focus has really been on the youth program and the other thing that we really want to try and focus which we're going to start projecting now is trying to work with the summer camps because we think that we will have you know especially if we want to start some of the activities off early in the morning during the summer it's still cool enough and then Gwen had also touched about uh, the the covering the structure so we're looking at three different types of coverings um, one of them is either going to be a bubble cover one would be uh, a metal cover, and then the other one is kind of a synthetic plastic. Um, and the biggest thing that we're trying to figure out is how we're going to temperature control it, because even if you have a cover, you're still going to need ventilation, even if, you know, without walls on there. So we're trying to figure it out, and things may actually progress faster than the extension that we're asking for. Um, you know, the project's going to cost a couple hundred thousand dollars to, to put it in a, a dollar and cent um uh, perspective so that's why it's something that we want to make sure we do it right and something that's going to last for a good period of time we don't want to just do it and then have it start to deteriorate and look look poorly um so that's kind of a, a couple of the really you know new things that we're we're looking for um anything you want to add yeah sure i can touch i'm scott's business partner but uh I'm there 24-7, seven days a week. So. Um, we also own an ice rink in Van Nuys, so we've been in this business for over 30 years between the two of us. And uh, the great thing, uh, Gwen actually touched on it uh, earlier, that uh, we basically had to start over. We, we came to you guys with this proposal, and everything was, you know, golden and then the previous owner we had no idea was going to open up a facility less than five miles down the road so it was start over and from the time that we basically had to start over to today um, we have not given Gwen the winter numbers yet we just released our fall numbers to her but our youth uh, uh, winter numbers uh, just started and uh, we're up to not 81 kids so it's you can see in the uh, statistics that, that she uh, put together for you guys is that it went from 51 in the fall, and now we're up 81. So we've grown like another 30 players. And the great part about it is um, we have given a free season to all Burbank residents. So any, any of you guys have kids, you're more than welcome to come to our program. You can play the first season for free. It was a way of getting kids um, used to the sport, and if they liked it or if they didn't like it, it wasn't a big investment for the family. It's free. So come try it out. If you like it, we provide all the gear. It's a no-brainer, and the, the numbers have, have definitely started to increase. So we're really happy about that. Our adult numbers right across the board, we're at like 28 adult teams and growing. Um, but it is a turf war. We're, we're basically – fighting the other league for players and we're back and forth and back and forth. And the way that we see to an end to this is to put major improvements into our facility. And that's what we're, that's the plan here. So we've been, uh, we, I should have started by telling you, we really, really appreciate your patience with us. Um, this roof would have been constructed probably by now, but we do need a little bit more time. And uh, that's about it. I thank you. I appreciate it. Any uh, questions? Uh, board member Gessau. Thank you, Chair Berghoff. So you guys own Iceland? Uh, no, we own L.A. We Kings LA. Valley Ice Center. It's Panorama City. Panorama We're City. Off Van Nuys Boulevard. Oh, okay. yeah. Off Van Nuys Boulevard. Yeah, but okay. Iceland is for sale. So huh? <laughs> the, the property is for sale. I'm, I'm not surprised. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, so my kid started playing hockey when he was that size. Oh, wow. That's and so this brought back great memories to me and... Uh, uh, I'm going to take this home and show yeah, it to him. Great. So does, does, does my son get a free? <laughs> Absolutely. He's only 31. Absolutely. He's only 30. Perfect. Bring him in. We'll give him a free one. We'll, we'll gear him up and everything. He has he has equipment. <laughs> oh, perfect. Well, no. if he play, if he played ice, send him over to – yeah, he can come, come skate with me on Tuesday nights. He played ice. <laughs> so i I just like to tell you that uh, I'm thrilled that you're growing that facility and uh, – Frankly, I hope my colleagues on this board and on the council have the patience to wait for the things that will happen, um, and everything happens when it's supposed to, and just keep up the good work. Thank keep you. Grow, keep you. growing that 
youth you. program. Well, and Thank one you. one other thing I want to add uh, over at uh, some of the teams at Pickwick, some of the travel teams also come and they rent out the facility to uh, do like dry land and stick training, uh, you know, with just tennis shoes on and all that kind of stuff. So that's we've had a really good support uh, with uh, the local the, ice rink. Yeah, with the Bears. So cool. Thank you. Thank you. I actually wasn't aware of the program being a new board member, and so I just think that this is an exciting opportunity for our kids and our, our families here to be able to be healthy and participate in a fun activity. I do ice skating, so do my kids, and we know a lot of hockey players as well. And knowing the cost to be able to participate in hockey and the equipment to be able to do this ball hockey program is what a, a great opportunity for our families here. So thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Any other comments? Board Member uh, DePaulo? Thank you, Chair Bergdorf. Um, I have came by your facility several nights a week, and I'm really impressed with the number of youth, and I really like the, um, the ball hockey concept that introduces uh, a lot of the young kids to, that, to the game, and it's, it's affordable, and so I applaud you on that. And what I'm really impressed with is, is uh, you all are doing this the right way. Um, and you're very above board and very transparent, and uh, that's impressive. Um, and I wish you nothing but the best. I think this is wonderful for our city. And um, keep up the good work. And I like the lacrosse. That's a that's kind of a happening sport now. Yeah, it is. It's all over the place. Um, pretty soon, high schools are going to have it. Yeah. A lot of high schools already a lot do. Of them do, but. Um, but uh, anyway, thank you all so much for coming today, and Thanks. I wish you nothing but the best. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you. Thank you. I have one quick comment. I yes, I am disappointed you're not putting up the shade uh, because it gets so hot in the summer and putting it off a couple of years may deter some of the kids, parents, you know, bringing their kids in the summer. Um, but I understand. We, we well, may. We've, ad yeah, you, 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 we, we've addressed that. What we've done with our youth program is the games don't start until 5, 15 p.m. on Sundays. So it gives them the whole day to either do family time, church time, whatever they can do with their families during the day. And then by 5 p.m. I'm sorry. Hello, hello. Uh, by 5 p.m., the sun has come down quite a bit. Okay. And our last game ending, uh, we want to get the kids home on because of school the next day. They're done around 7.30, 8 p.m. So from 5 to 8, 8, 15, they're out of there. It's not, the temperatures aren't as high, but we're already addressing something for the summer months because it does get a little warmer. Yeah. So we're going to either play early morning or we're <clears> going to even go a little bit later. So. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, Steph, thank you. do we need to vote on deferring the shade as well as the rubberized surface it's not necessary uh, that has to go to council okay. for, for approval but certainly if there's an endorsement that wouldn't hurt as well do we want to yes board thank member. you Trevor Garf. Uh, and as far as the heat goes um you know, we have our, our baseball and our, our, our basketball type programs, and, and, and it gets pretty hot out there during baseball season also. And there are some games on Saturday mornings, but um, just uh, I would uh, how important it is to have uh, uh, hydration, water out there for the kids. And um, um, I, I, I think if you – obviously you have common sense, and just uh, that's that's the only precaution, and I think it'll it'll be fine, you know. Like, and also just a point of interest, we've also installed commercial fans, you know, the fans that are literally about this big. So in, in, in each of the, uh, on the benches or dugouts, whatever you want to refer them to. So we have electrical going to them. We have those blowing during the games so that the kids are in there. It's circulating, but they're huge fans. I meant, you know, big they're industrial the big fans. industrial fans. So, Helps quite a bit. yeah. And is it different? Is it kind of like a learning? It's almost like a entry level like t-ball where the there is some where you actually stop play and instruct is that well, what we do is we do uh yeah sure i'll talk again uh what we do is we do practices on wednesdays and fridays uh, at 5 30 p.m they're one hour and then all our games are on sundays for the kids program um and the great thing about this youth program is we we needed to find like i had mentioned earlier we're we're still having these turf wars and we needed to find something that we were going to have a, a niche of our own and we 
rather than competing against other facilities and, and trying to grab their kids and everybody and you know there's only a big enough pool for all of us we we thought of the street hockey league you know kids don't know need to know how to skate and a lot of kids are don't play hockey because they don't know how to skate so we started the street hockey league most kids know how to run kids most children know how to run and we provide all the gear so it's just and it's very affordable even after they play their first season for Burbank residents the following season if they like to play it's only $75 for a 12-week season so it's very very affordable for all so we've kept it that way and as long as we can uh, build we'll be able to keep it uh, our numbers low like that so good okay one quick question have you uh gone over to our skate park at valley park and um i have not yet that, that that would i would recommend that you do that if you wish um there are a group of kids over there that you know the skateboarders yeah. and uh, um the bmx bicycles and the scooters they just might be interested we've had some great uh we have some great families here in burbank and and the ones that are participating in the league they have been very helpful um we are not a nonprofit organization so it's been a little difficult for us to get information out to the schools um some of the mm -hmm. the the moms and that that have been on ptas have been distributing information for us um some of the private schools that do allow us to do that um but yeah any help that you guys can ever you know throw our way we'd greatly Please. appreciate it as well i would also suggest re <clears throat> excuse me reaching out to the boys and girls club yes go there sure. and, and talk to shanna warren the yes. executive director yes. and hand out flyers and yes. maybe she'll let you talk to some of the you know yeah, to I've the group actually, of kids I've, yeah thank you i've actually spoke with her and we've spoke with the ymca over in yes. sherman uh, is in sherman oaks or studio city and we're kind of doing a little uh i'm going to try to do some cross and we have a promotion. ymca right here yeah. On um, 3rd and Magnolia, yes. we have our own YMCA. Yes. Thank you. Thank Maybe you. partnering with them to offer the yeah. classes at your facility. Yes, that's a great idea. Thank you. Yes, Chair. Uh, Board <laughs> Member Lauer. <laughs> I'd like, <clears throat> excuse me, I'd like to see us formally um, uh, recommend the council approve the amendment to the agreement as a board. <clears throat> so would I make a motion? I so move. Second. All right. All in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you. Looks like it passes. Thank you. Thank you. All right, guys. All right, is that it? Have a happy Valentine's Day, everyone. Yep, hey. happy Valentine's you Day. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> All right, next we have uh, Jenny Griffin. Good evening, Chair Bergdorf and members of the board. My name is Jenny Griffin. I'm a recreation supervisor in the Parks and Recreation Department. I'm happy to be here this evening with you to provide, to provide you with an update on program enhancements that have been made to the Military Service Recognition Program. Let me first start by giving you a brief background of how the military program began. Um, it was created in March of 2006. Um, the city of Burbank has had a long-standing history of honoring and recognizing their commu the community members who are actively serving in the military. The Military Service Recognition Program was created in 2006 at the request of the city council. Initially, um, at the startup of the program, we put up 35 personalized banners, um, were, were installed along with 47 generic All Our Veterans banners. And those, <clears throat> excuse me, those banners were put up at that time be on 3rd Street between Olive Avenue and Amherst. Um, some of the program details, the eligibility and fee at the time. Um, eligibility requirements obviously were established at the time, um, much the same as we have now. Applicants were required or are required to be a Burbank resident or to be a family member of a Burbank resident. The program initial, uh, initially was donation-based. It was $150 was the suggested donation. Sometimes we collected that, sometimes we didn't. Again, it was a suggested donation. Um, there was not a time limit that was established at that point in time on how long these banners would remain up. Um, the banner display itself 
once an application is received, this is the same, same process that we do now. Um, de department staff will work with our Burbank Veterans Committee. We have a couple members of the Burbank Veterans Committee um, that act as our decision makers as far as if the banners are going to be able to go up, they look at all the paperwork that accompanies the application. Um, and then department staff will work with our contracted banner company um, to install that personalized banner. Um, at that time then, a ban the banner recipient and family are notified that the banner was installed and then they're given a map so that they can better locate their banner. Um, the banner and honoree, banner honoree and family and friends will then be invited to a city council meeting um, where they will be recognized. The mayor will get up, give a nice little presentation, um, and then they'll get a certificate of recognition. Typically it's just the family members um, because the person is serving at that time. Um, once the participant is no longer serving and they're back, um, they, their banner will be obviously taken down and then it will be presented to them at the City of Burbank's Veterans Day ceremony. Um, now let's look at the reasons why we decided that we needed to do updates to this program. In this next slide, you can see very clearly, um, it's, these next few slides actually are gonna depict to you the condition that these banners were in when the program began to be evaluated. Um, wind damage, fading due to sun, um, weathered because of the rain, trees in many cases that were probably pretty small at the time that the banners went up had now over, you know, taken over some of these banners. The banners were sitting, you know, within the trees, um, so, Obviously, these needed to be addressed. You can see specifically the one on the right. You know, you have one that's bent and faded, the other one that's completely torn and hanging. Um, <clears throat> the next slide, you can see, again, just the, you know, how the inclement weather conditions caused major, major fading to the banners. Um, many, of, many of these banners that were up, they were not only weathered, but due to the amount of years that they had been up, they were just aged. They were old, deteriorated. Um, several of the banners had been up since the start of the program. If we count backwards, that's 13 years. So we probably had at least a couple of, you know, maybe like five or six of them that had been up for the duration. That's, that's a lot of years given the, the lifespan of these. Um, without having a set time frame, Again, that's the key here. Without having that set time frame on how long a banner should be installed, the banners would remain up until the honoree was no longer serving. Oftentimes we weren't notified of that or when staff were making those phone calls, veterans committee were making those phone calls, it wasn't something that was being shared with us. We weren't able to get in touch with people. So here's what came next. Um, the program evaluation and research period. Um, in 2017, staff began the process of evaluating the current program and then strategizing about the best updates for the city of Burbank's military service recognition program. Uh, research began by looking at other local communities. Um, we researched places like Rancho Cucamonga, Santa Clarita, Moreno Valley, Temecula. Each program, to be honest, is very unique in its own. Some are very similar to what we were running where it was donation-based. Other ones have very high fees. Other ones, they're actually only putting up their banners several times per year. They typically put them up right at Memorial Day, right at Veterans Day, and then they're removed. Um, so we did an assessment. We, you know, checked into all these communities to see how they were operating their programs. Um, we worked with the contracted banner company that we utilized to have the most up-to-date information on banner lifespan, fade warranties, and the quality of the banner. Because the quality of the banner obviously has changed in 13 years. The lifespan actually went up by a year from what it was previously. Um, the Burbank Veterans Committee assisted staff with calls, letters, emails, et cetera, um, to program participants so that an updated database could be created. We implemented new program policies. Um, and then one of the biggest things that ended up happening was the coordination of putting up banners alongside of our downtown Burbank banners, which had gone up probably either in early 2019 or late 2018, um, which 
is also an incredibly important program. So at, you know, probably maybe the September mark of 2019, we had to actually work alongside of um, the community development department just to ensure the fact that they could keep their banners up, we could have our banners up, um, and it was an easy process. Um, then lastly, the best part was the removal of outdated banners and the installation of our new banners, which is great. Um, Obviously, one of the most notable updates when we made this um, made these updates was the program fee. Again, remember we were only doing a one hundred and fifty dollars suggested donation before. Um, so, after considering the cost associated with the production, installation, and removal of a banner, staff determined that a fee of two hundred and twenty-five dollars per banner would be appropriate. Um, this is what the $225 will get you. It will get you one double-sided banner, um, the installation and removal of that banner, and then a two-year display period. Um, in order to keep the cost reasonable, banner installations will take place in May and October. They'll stay up year-round, but we're only doing installations and removals during those two months. So it'll be May prior to Memorial Day, October prior to Veterans Day. Um, this update is definitely a change from what was previously done, where installations and removals took place according to whenever applications were received. Um, installing and removing only two times per year will greatly reduce the cost associated with this process. Keep in mind there's permit fees, there's you know fees that the company itself is charging us as well every time they're going out. Um, so what will happen after the two-year display period? This is where, you know, it's the how, how we're going to make this program sustainable. Um, in order to ensure a successful program, we put renewal options in place. Um, so option number one is $50, um, and that'll be a $50 renewal fee per year for up to two years. You're not getting a new banner. Your same banner that's currently up will be the banner that stays up $50 per year, two years max on that. Option number two is $125, and that will get you a new banner, um, again, for a two-year period. This structure allows for a single banner to have a display time of four years max. Five years is actually the lifespan of the banner. So doing the four years is great because, yeah, we're, we're ensuring the fact that these banners are always in good condition. Um, given that fading and aging was an issue in the past, um, the department wanted to have a system in place for our military service recognition program to have success. That was important to us. Um, the new banners, um, this is, I think, my favorite slide of the whole the whole thing is the comparison between these two. So these are the same same banners, same banner, you know, the, the people that it's for, Jessica Maxwell and uh, Michael Maxwell, or I believe it's Michael Maxwell. Um, it's a great comparison. I mean, it basically shows you, you know, how faded, how worn out these banners were, and then, you know, the new updated banners, how great they look. Um, through the process of updating the banners, um, we did end up removing 28 old and outdated banners, 15 banner holders who were unreachable. So that means after numerous tries of letters, calls, et cetera, we were unable to reach out, to, were unable to reach them. So their banners came down as well. Um, and then on November 4th of this last year, we put up 41 new banners um, for those who are still actively serving. Um, the department was able to fund the cost of the 41 new, new banners using carryover dollars from previous years. So since there was about a two-year period of time that we were researching um, and you know trying to get the most updates and trying to come up with the best program, um, we were able to save those carryover dollars and we were actually able to fund the whole cost of all 41 of those, which is great. Um, some no, no, other notable updates is our program application. Um, I think always with the update of a program, it's great to have new marketing materials. Um, you know, it was great to look back and see what some of the things were that worked on the previous application, but it's also great to implement changes to make our new application work better for families and staff. Um, the layout of this updated application allows for us most importantly, to have more contact information, which is incredibly important given that we were struggling getting in touch with people um, in the past. Um, program requirements, fees, and policies are all very easy to read in this application. 
Um, in total, since the inception of the program, 133 banners have been installed. So that's from 2006 up until now. Um, we just had three, three banners that went up two weeks ago as well. Um, so program enhancements have created a sustainable program that will now bring in needed revenue to continue to maintain this program for the future, which is very important. Um, as a department, we are so proud to continue honoring and recognizing Burbank residents who are actively serving. And I think, you know, a couple of the key things that I'd like to touch on are, you know, the families that we meet, the staff, you know, ourselves. It's so great to have these conversations with families. We don't oftentimes actually even meet the person who's in the service. It's the families who we're speaking to day in and day out. You know, they're the ones that call us and let us know, you know, how grateful they are for the things that we're doing and providing to them. Um, and, you know, getting to honor them at, you know, whether it's the council meeting, whether it's the Veterans Day ceremony, it really does mean a lot, you know, and, and we keep in contact with them. Um, you know, and so I think in turn, it's not only is it a special day when a banner goes up for, um, you know, one of the people, one of the honorees, it's special for us as well. We take pride, we drive up and down the street, you know, we had windstorms this last week, we had three or four of our banners that came down. We were on it right away. We made sure that those banners got right back up because we know how much it means to the families. And like I said, we take pride in it. Um, I would like to say quickly, um, without my coworker, who he's not here tonight, but Dave Mudgett, he was the force behind this. He did a tremendous job. The database itself is incredible. I mean, it spells everything out very easily. It's easy for us to keep track of what years people got their banners, when the next time is that we need to check in with them, which is important. Again, that's important in keeping this program fresh and updated. Um, the banners currently are located, in case you don't know, on 3rd Street between Olive Avenue and Cypress. So it's a little bit different than where they were before. We'll continue to grow that program. I'm sure that it will, you know, at some point be back down to Amherst again. Um, if you haven't seen them, please go and take a look, though. We would appreciate that. Um, and in conclusion, and speaking from my own heart, I just want to let you guys know that as a as a staff person who works here, but also as somebody who lives in this community, I think that this is just a great program. It really means a lot for me to get to work with them. Um, and I think just the people of the community should be proud. You know, it's a nice place for them to drive and see the people that are serving from our community. Um, thank you for listening. I'm happy to take any questions, hear any comments. All right, let's start with our board member, uh, board member Gus Howe. Thank you, Chair Bergdorf, and thank you, Jenny. Great, mm -hmm. great report. So I want to run through a couple of numbers here and see if you won't need a calculator, but I okay. just want to see if I understand <laughs> what, what I got here. Good. I used one. but you know. Okay. So we ask, there are how many total slots right now? 41? We have 41 total banners up. 41 currently. total banners. Mm -hmm. And so 41 total banners, and we ask, the family to donate $225 mm -hmm. to put them up. So that's $9,225. Over 13 years, we've had a total of 133 banners. Mm -hmm. So the average is about 10 a year, even if it was 12. So if we had, if, so that means that 10, average 10 each year times $225 is $2,250. Okay, so that's fairly simple math. What I don't understand is why our city's not paying for this instead of asking the families to pay for this. These men and women in service are serving our country. This is not a big line item in our budget. We're talking about peanuts compared to some other programs that we could probably come up with that are may not be as important as these things, but we support them because it's the right thing to do in Burbank. I think the right thing to do in Burbank is for us to support those families who send their children off to wherever they send them off to. And for less than $10,000 a year, less than $10,000 a year, I, I got to believe we can find that in our budget someplace so that we don't have to ask these families to come up with anything 
we should be just honoring them. Board member Lowers. I was kind of thinking the same thing, but <clears throat> I'm a Rotarian. So, of course, my my brain immediately went to, oh, okay, Rotary Club's fun. Okay. My, yeah, that's the way my brain immediately went to is um, it does, it bothers me too that uh, we make the, the families are already, um, you know, doing such a service to our community and our country by um, having their young people serve. It would, it's really difficult for me to, to think about asking them for money when they've already made this tremendous sacrifice. I would like to find some other way to fund these rather than uh, them funding them, whether it be service clubs or fundraisers. I imagine there's a lot of people in the community that would feel similarly. Um, and that was, that was what I was going to say. And yeah, it'd be great. With the, with, with the city, but, you know, I know the city's position is kind of difficult because you open one door and a lot of doors open. But, um, you know, it would be nice maybe to put it out to the service clubs or find some other funding mechanism that didn't require them to have to do it. That's all I had to say. Yes, board member DiPaolo. Um, first of all, you know, I, I agree with that, but I also think that there are fundraisers and... Uh, we could do fundraisers. Uh, the Veterans Committee has done several fundraisers. Mm -hmm. um, if there is a uh, golf tournament at DeBell, maybe we could uh, get with uh, somebody that's running a golf tournament, like a Kiwanis, or, and ask them if part of the proceeds could go towards the banner program. I think that where there's a will, there's a way. But uh, let me say one thing. Um, from the history of this banner program, Monrovia is really the – I think the first city to start a banner program. And one of my colleagues on the Veterans Committee, retired Burbank Police Lieutenant, Miss Chris Welker, this is really her brainchild. She came and said, you know, hey, what do you think? And we, yeah, so I believe she even went to the department first and then it went to city council and, and it was approved. But, um, and um, yeah, we can do fundraisers or if there's money to be uh, allocated, that's fine. But speaking as somebody that served and speaking for my mother and father, God bless them, if this program was intact when I was overseas, they would have gladly paid $225, you know. And, but a lot of people can't afford that, you know, and, and um, that was a lot of money. That's a lot of money for some people. So I can understand why we should maybe look for some uh, money to appro appropriate. Mm -hmm. But I'm really impressed from... Miss Garcia and Miss Wilkie and Chris Smith and Catherine Labrado and you, Jenny, and Dave, for all your hard work. Um, you don't, I know you realize how important this is to the families and the fact that all of you are so sincere in your dedication. Uh, that, that is, uh, doesn't, doesn't go unnoticed. I just want you to know that it is wonderful what you have done with this program. And it makes not only our department, but our entire city, people know that we are here for all the veterans and their families. And um, when you drive down Olive to Cyprus there, it's so impressive. And uh, the new banners are wonderful. But I just want to thank all of you for your hard work. And um, it wouldn't happen without you. It all started at, at like ground level, but now this program is flourishing, and um, I just want to thank you all from the bottom of my heart for what you have done. It's very, very nice. And thanks to the Parks Department for getting out there when we have the winds and scooping up the banners, and it's a real team effort. So once again, thank you all very much. Thank you, Jenny. That was an excellent presentation. Thank you. Very uh, factual with all the details. Um, I agree with my colleagues uh, reaching out to the Kiwanis organization. Also, we have the VFW, the Veterans of Foreign Wars. And aren't there other? I'm not. I'm not familiar. But are there other organizations that are also service? Certainly, but I, I think I think the four biggest service clubs in our community, though of the two Rotary Clubs and the two Kiwanis Clubs. There are some others. There's a Lions Club. I believe there's an Elks Club. Mm -hmm. And there is a, um, and there's the Masons as well. But I think if 
I, I think the city can find uh, this is going to be less than five thousand dollars a year. I, I mean, unless you have to replace all of them, we're not going to replace all of them. And they do a phenomenal job with this, as my colleague Mr. DePaulo said. I just don't think we should be asking the families to do this. I think we should ask the city to do it. And I can tell you, if the city can't do it, I'll make a commitment that my Rotary Club or the, our Rotary Clubs will find a way to do it. Because it, it shouldn't have to be, it, it shouldn't have to sit on the shoulders of the families who sent their kids off to war. What, excuse me, what is the name of the organization, that club that's on Hollywood Way by the airport behind the post office? That's the Elks. The Elks. The Elks. That's the Elks. Like Elks and the Moose Clubs and those types of organizations. Can, can we reach out to them as well? Because I'm sure a lot of their members are veterans. Sure we can. And and there actually is a movement to try and form some kind of an inter-club association, but that's really not gotten off its feet yet. Um, but, at, but as I said, I can tell you that if I put this before my Rotary Club, we'd pay for this. Board member uh, Gummy. Yes. Thank you for your presentation. We appreciate yeah, of it. Course. What are the options if a family can't afford the banner? We are currently looking into, you know, more of the sponsorship program. So, I mean, we we do. We have people on occasion who will just simply donate money towards it. So, I mean, that's cer certainly something with the new marketing materials that are coming out. We can do a sponsor sponsorship program along with that. Um, that's something, like I said, in the past we've had. A lot of times people don't even necessarily know the person they're donating towards. They just want to donate money. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, board member DePaulo. And, and we have at, at our ceremonies, we've also gotten donations at our ceremonies for yes. our the upkeep of the memorials or anything veterans uh, veterans related. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, I'll, uh, since I'm the captain of the VFW, I'll, at, at least until April, uh, but I'm still very involved there, um, you know, uh, you can use our facility anytime you want. And we do reach out to the Elks and other, other areas. But uh, I know that we can do some good fundraising and um, uh, maybe that's the way to go. Everybody has a kind of piece of pie, so to speak. And mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a wonderful feeling to drive by and say, yeah, our, our service club is a part of this program. Yep. And uh, it's just a win-win for everybody. So once again, Jenny, thank you so much thank for you. the nice report. Go ahead, board member. Gus Jenny, would it be possible to put together the numbers that have been spent on that program for like a five-year period? Yeah. Is that a lot of work? No. That would be, yeah. Because I'd like to that. see what the average is. I, I, my guess is, after looking at the numbers, that my guess is the average per year is under $5,000. It's probably closer to 3000 And i just like to know what that number is so I can... See what I can do. Sure. I'm going to turn to Ms. Garcia. Yes, if I may. Um, I, I just want to make sure that the board um, knows that the city council as well as staff feels very strongly about this program and we support it wholeheartedly. Um, as staff was looking at this program, one of the things that we were um, also tasked with is looking, making sure that this program falls within our, our cost recovery policy, which uh, a a military banner recognizing an individual granted it is also for the entire community we are looking to make sure that there was some sort uh it wasn't 100 uh, percent subsidized by the general fund um for various reasons uh one it's it's means something to the individual family so there's that it's not a uh an expectation of a community to have a military banner program. So we were trying to find that, that balance. Um, additionally, I just want to make sure that, that the board understands that the city council still is supporting this program. The department receives $2,700 annually uh, to support the military banner program. What we wanted to do was to create a more vibrant and sustainable way to maintain the banners in the condition that they are right now. So we absolutely can provide, actually from the inception of the program, uh, and provide the board um, a total uh, cost or total uh, support that we have received from the city council. And it's not a lot of money, but that you can see that 
we didn't get a lot of money and that's why the con- the banners were not in a great condition. So what we want to do is find that right balance between um, making sure that these banners are replaced every two to four years, depending on on the need and the request and the service. So it's it's tricky. There are competing needs, and that's not to say that staff has not requested funding on an ongoing basis to the city council. At times we do get funding, at times we don't, because of the competing needs. Granted, uh, priorities have changed. There is additional money, but the Measure P dollars that the city is receiving is earmarked for a capital improvement, and I don't know that this program would necessarily fall under that, but we would um, absolutely welcome and look into additional support and work with service clubs to see if we can get additional uh, funding uh, to maybe lower that cost or subsidize those families that cannot provide uh, the funds. Totally understand where the city has to be on this position because we had a we actually had a discussion earlier today about Measure P funds and and how they're spent and I think the oversight is extremely important because if we do have to go back to the to the city again at some future time, we want to be sure that we did our due diligence and made sure that the funds, the things that we promised we would spend that money on is what we spent that money on and not anything else. I don't have any problem with that at all. All I'm saying is I don't think the families should be shouldered with the responsibility of coming up with the funding. They have done enough by providing their kids. And I think this city has shown that it is very grateful to all who serve. Um, Mr. DiPaolo's ceremonies, uh, the, the city ceremony that Mr. DiPaolo is involved with in for Memorial Day and Veterans Day are two of my favorite days. And I think most of the veterans in this town and a lot of other people turn out for them. I'm just saying this is one thing I think someone can do for these families. And whether it's the city or the Rotary Club or the VFW or Kiwanis, all I want to see is I want to see, I think a solution is necessary so that those families don't have to spend that money. Instead, let them take that money and send their kids something. That's all. Any more comments? Thank you very much. (laughs) All right. Our next uh, presentation is by Mary Young. She will be presenting the budget overview for 2020 to 2021. Yeah. Um, I I don't have a PowerPoint for this, so just the presentation. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, good evening, Chair Bergdorf and members of the Park Board. My name is Mary Young, and it is it gives me great pleasure to give you an update on our fiscal year 2020-2021 budget planning efforts. Um, Before the budget process officially kicked off on December 12, 2019, for the upcoming fiscal year, our city manager met with the Financial Services Department to set forth some parameters for city departments to follow. These parameters state that, if possible, all new budget requests should be supported by enhanced revenues or offsetting reductions in other accounts. In other words, ideally, a budget request should be backed by offsetting revenues or a budget cut made someplace else. To date, staff has submitted a number of revenue offset requests. Our requests include expanding both the summer day camp and our recreational swim programs by one week to accommodate for the additional week of BUSD summer break. Fees collected for the programs will offset the requests. Additional funds to cover day camp field trips have been requested. Uh, Administration prices continue to raise on an annual basis. Day camp fees will offset this increase. We've requested funding to support for the city's concert operations at the Starlight Bowl, which is offset by the fees our concert promoters pay us to offer the expanded programming. 
We've proposed to use restricted art and public places funds for the utility box beautification program and the annual maintenance of public art, including a lot of the art you see right here in the city council chambers. Um, We've asked for revenue offset funds for DeBell restaurant gratuities. Uh, this expense was not originally included in the operating budget for DeBell golf course restaurant. Essentially what that is is when patrons dine at the restaurant and the gratuity for the wait staff is charged to a credit card instead of paying in cash, um, the restaurant collects the gratuity slash revenues and pays it back to the employees through payroll. Um, it's almost like a clearing account, so funds are needed to cover this expense that will be cleared by gratuities that come on the back end. Uh, additional requests that are not revenue offset include funding to chemically treat trees susceptible to, um, I hope I'm saying this correctly, polyphagous shot hole borer beetles, um, and funds to operate the Employee Wellness Center. Who knew? It's a threat. Um, a little bit of background about the Employee Wellness Center. Um, our former city manager, Ron Davis, instructed Public Works to construct an Employee Wellness Center located at McCambridge Park. Parks and Recreation has been tasked with the day-to-day -day operations and maintenance of the facility. Funds are needed to cover custodial services and equipment maintenance and replacement. Uh, staffing costs to oversee the facility have been absorbed by the Parks and Recreation Department. Um, with the passage of Measure P in November of 2018 and the sales tax increase from 9.5% to 10 and a quarter back in April of last year, more focus has been given to the city's infrastructure. An infrastructure oversight board was created whose purpose is to provide as the name states, oversight for the city's infrastructure. Citywide, all departments responsible for infrastructure have identified their infrastructure needs. The Parks and Recreation Department has programmatic and capital improvement requests for the upcoming fiscal year presented to the Infrastructure Oversight Board. Uh, programmatic capital projects are those projects that you would expect to maintain and upkeep year after year. These are ongoing projects that receive funding Every year, examples would include park playground equipment and replacement, replacement of citywide irrigation systems, picnic facility imp improvements, uh, indoor-outdoor gym floor resurfacing. All of these projects are ones that need a constant annual funding for programmatic capital upkeep. Uh, capital improvement pro projects as opposed to the programmatic capital projects, tend to be the ones where you work on it, then you're done. Uh, for example, Brace Canyon Park ball field improvements, where we plan to replace the turf at Brace Canyon Park ball field with artificial turf, a community garden, or Burbank Little Theater renovations. These are projects that would be done once complete. They are not an ongoing programmatic capital project. Um, as part of the budget process, there are several budget study sessions scheduled in the upcoming months of April and May that are open to the public. You're all welcome to attend these sessions where the fiscal year 2020-2021 proposed operating and capital budget will be discussed. All sessions are held on Tuesdays starting at 6 p.m. right here in the City Council Chambers. The sessions are televised if you are unable to attend, if needed, um, so the first budget su study session will be held on April 14th, um, and if needed, a continuation study session will be held the following week on April 21st. A public hearing on the upcoming utility rates will be held on May 5th. The fiscal year 2020-2021 operating and capital budgets are slated to be adopted on May 12th. Uh, we will keep you all abreast of any changes to the budget. This concludes my presentation, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. I hope I didn't bore you all. Very interesting. Thank you. Any comments, uh, Board Member Gassau? Thank you, Chair Bergdorf. Thank you, Mary. That was a great presentation. It wasn't boring. Um, I actually read it before today. The shot, oh. the shot yeah, that, <laughs> that guy? Yeah, he's he. Yes. Yeah. So I had, I had a couple of questions, and these questions are probably for Ms. Garcia or maybe Ms. Smith. I'm not sure who, but so in going through these items, 
I see a restaurant room divider at uh, the Bell as an improvement. Are we talking about something other than the divider that's there today, separating the community room from the restaurant itself? Uh, no, that's that's exactly it. Um, it's it's uh, replacing potentially replacing that. Um, it's kind of it's a glass wall with Soundproof? a couple of doors. Yes. So that would, uh, we're looking at that um, to replace that with um, like more of like a accordion or foldable doors to allow for um, larger events that might want to utilize the entire restaurant facility. Because right now it doesn't, it's not as conducive for a larger party. And so we're looking at, at those improvements at DeBell in particular that um, would give us a return on our investment. That would make sense. So as we're looking at that, are we looking only at that one spot or are we looking at making more divisions in that room? Because it seems to me, I, I spend a bit of time up there, it seems to me that it would be great for us to be able to have another set of doors a little closer to the bar to make the restaurant area smaller and the community room for privacy larger so we don't have to close the facility when we have an event is that something we're looking at or is that beyond the scope of this that's beyond the scope of of this year's funding however we are have a projection to look at actually uh, something slightly different but actually potentially expanding that community room out to where the 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 outdoor patio area is Great. So we, we do have that in mind. So we want to, we think it would make more sense to keep the restaurant the way it is and that community room expanded out for uh, larger that would be other great. types of events. But absolutely, that is Cause, a Of course, I can tell you, my Rotary Club meets there and we're about maxed out. If we get too many more members, we'll have to look for a new place to meet. Um, so that's one. Second question, last question. I think it's the last question. Yeah, last question. Down the bottom where it says uh, public works, city building, seismic strengthening, and retrofit. I see the DeBell driving range, the golf maintenance building, Robert Gross Park, and the exercise building. Has there been any discussion about that old cart barn on DeBell golf course and getting rid of that? Because it can't be getting any cheaper as time goes on. Yes, to answer your question, yes, there have been discussions about uh, demolishing that. Uh, we are uh, have had uh, conversations with Public Works. There are um, some clearly some some challenges that we'd have to address. So our priority is to make sure that our facilities are first seismic that that people are in are seismically retrofitted, and then we would go back and uh, demolish that old cart barn that needs to be demolished. And there's you know. Um, hazardous materials within that and electronics too Correct. yeah Correct. so thank you i assume that was the case i just wanted to get on the record with that because i think that eventually we should have a find a way to get rid of that thing because it's really makes a mess of things down the at 17 and 18 there we agree but thank you this is a great report any more comments by the board member none Thank you so much. All right, next we have the consent calendar. I'm going to read each one. If you'd like any of them to be pulled uh, after I've read them, let me know. If not, we'll make one motion to approve the consent calendar. The first item is the approval of the minutes of January 9th, 2020. Uh, we have the City Council agenda items update. We have the contract compliance report. We have the park patrol report and the departmental operation update. Do I have a motion? Motion. Do I have a second. second? All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, do we have any tabled items? How about any additional comments by our board members? Do we have any? All right. Yes. Um, I just want to uh, give kudos to the sports office. Uh, they're getting ready for their baseball season and softball season, and the numbers are way up. And they're doing a lot of really good things, and they're getting ready for the summer. Uh, instructional uh, programs and uh, 
uh, every time I go to the uh, BAF uh, meetings, I'm impressed with not only the BAF board, who are really, really some great people, but just our staff in the sports office and uh, their commitment to uh, kind of use a Raider term, their com- commitment to excellence. That's exactly what they do. And I'm, I, I, our sports, municipal sports program, and including our, our whole department, is, is really the cutting edge. So I just want to, um, you know, congratulate the sports office uh, headed up by Diego and uh, all their hard work and what they're doing right now. Thank you. Thank you, Board Member DePaulo. Any other comments? If none, uh, how about introduction of any new agenda items would like to bring up? None? I'm looking around. All right. With that, we are adjourned. Thank you.